Welcome back to the channel. A few weeks ago, I was about to record a video of danger shock. I just read the paper. I was about to give my critical appraisal of the study in the New England Journal when I was interrupted. So I'm going to pick up where I left off. I re-reviewed the paper. I've got a few thoughts about danger shock, which is, to my knowledge, the first positive randomized control trial of the Impella device in cardiogenic shock. A very interesting paper by the folks in Odense, Denmark. It's called Microaxial Flow Pump or Standard Care in Infarct-Related Cardiogenic Shock. And it is a positive randomized control trial. That's what they want you to know, that at last we have succeeded. Now, it's a very interesting study, and I have several points that I think people have not discussed enough. But I think one thing we have to concede at the outset is that this field could use a positive result. I mean, they've not been doing so well. IABP shock, the intraaortic balloon pump didn't work. ECMO didn't work just a year ago in the New England Journal. They're due for some good news in this field, and at last they've gotten it here with the Impella. But one thing that that also means is that the pretest probability a mechanical device will improve outcomes in shock has got to be low, because we've tried a couple of other times to pump that oxygenated blood forward or oxygenate it outside of the body and push it forward, and it didn't improve outcomes. So you have to approach this study, I think, with a pessimistic prior. Everybody in cardiology loves to be a Bayesian. They keep talking about Bayesian. They keep saying that, that p-value dichotomy, 0.05, it's not destiny. And even if it's 0.059, you know, you should think about it in the context of other studies. Except they don't want to be a Bayesian when the pretest probability is in the toilet. That's when everyone's like, well, we got a p-value less than 0.05, so let's run with that. That's when they don't want to be a Bayesian. And I think that's a problem for the interpretation of this study. It's a positive study, but it's barely positive. The p-value in this study is 0.05. Oh, 0.04. It's 0.04. It's barely positive. It's a small randomized control trial, just 300 and some patients. All right. So international multicenter randomized trial, STEMI, cardiogenic shock. It took 10 years to accrue. Now, one of the reasons it took 10 years to accrue is that the authors excluded most of the people in whom you might want to do this in. People with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest who had Glasgow Coloma scores less than eight were excluded from this study. If you look at the flow chart in the supplemental appendix, more people were excluded than included in the randomization. 435 people were excluded from the study. Now they make some excuse, I think. I call it an excuse because I think it is an excuse why they excluded those people. But those are people in whom this is deployed. We want evidence that pertains to actual clinical practice. You could have included those people. In fact, you ought to have included those people. And then you could have done uh, uh, an interaction, co a pre-specified subgroup analysis in those with GS, GCS over eight and looking for interaction, just like they did in recovery, you wouldn't have had to throw away all that information. I think it was a mistake to exclude those people, a big mistake. We don't have an answer for that. And that's in fact, probably the predominant population in which you'll want an answer. More people were excluded than included. I think that's a big problem. That's also why it took 10 years. You know, you might've been able to do a little bit faster had you included those people. And you definitely would have been able to do it faster if folks in the United States decided to participate too. See, in the United States, we just like to do things that we think might work. We don't like to actually run these important randomized control trials. So thanks for the folks in Europe for doing this work. Okay, the next point. The actual primary endpoint of 180-day morta mortality, I think, is quite good. It is, of course, barely significant. But what is the threshold of significance in this study? Is it 0.05? The p-value observed is 0.04. The confidence interval is 0.55 to 0.99. The 95% confidence interval bands are overlapping a fair bit. It's barely, barely, barely positive, death from any cause. And the significant p-value is not 0.05. That's a mistake. It's actually 0.048 because the authors say in the statistical plan that they have allocated some alpha to the interim analysis. But that really made me wonder who is allocating 0.02, no, 0 .002, 0 0.002 alpha to the interim analysis? Why are you allocating so little alpha to the interim analysis? That to me struck me as very odd. Did you want to see like some huge home run before you would halt the study? Did they actually run the interim analysis? I don't actually see when, when they did that. When was that done? So to me, that's a question. Why was it designed that way? I haven't heard anyone actually even broach this topic, so that's my question to the investigators. The next thing. This is a randomized trial, nominally, of getting the Impella pump or not getting the Impella pump. And that's the only thing that we did differently in the two groups, right? Wrong. There are other things we did differently in the two groups. 
one group of people, those that got the pump, they got more renal replacement therapy. Okay, maybe because of a complication of the pump, maybe for other reasons. They also got more pressors. They're getting more norepinephrine. They're getting more any vasopressor by about seven percentage points. Interestingly, in this paper, the people with the lower blood pressure upon admission were the ones to drive the greater benefit in subgroup analysis. Is it really the pump that's responsible for the benefit or the fact that the pump makes the doctor give more vasopressors and those people might actually need more vasopressors because they have lower blood pressure. That's why they're benefiting more. You see, that to me is a little bit interesting. It's not isolating the effect of the pump. It's isolating the pump plus the increased vasopressors. Next. The other problem with this study is what happens if the doctor wants to escalate care. If the doctor wants to escalate care in the control arm, they're reaching for things, and many things have been banned by these investigators. You can look in the protocol. They're banning the use of impella to escalate care in the control arm. There were some protocol deviations where people did that, I think only three. They're forcing those people to escalate to things like ECMO. And in fact, there is an increase of something like seven percentage point more people getting ECMO in the control arm as salvage than in the intervention arm. Well, we know ECMO doesn't improve outcomes. We know ECMO has more limb ischemia from the year study, a study a year before. Is it possible that this sliver, this barely there benefit is, can, is, is not due to routine pump placement, but the fact that people on the control arm are harmed by getting too much ECMO on the back end or getting futile ECMO, ECMO when it can't help and can only hurt? I think that's an open question. So the investigators haven't They kept saying that this is a homogenous study and that's why excluded all these people, but they haven't isolated the effect of the pump. They've got a few other things moving parts here. One more point. In the supplementary appendix of danger shock, they do an as-treated analysis, a per-protocol analysis. Now, I'm a purist. I like my intention to treat analyses, but typically when you go from in a superiority study, when you go from, maybe this is something that that people should understand, intention to treat means to analyze people as they're initially assigned and per-protocol means to analyze them as to what they actually received. As a general rule in superiority studies, what you want to see is a big per protocol benefit and a preserved benefit in the intention to treat population. In non-inferiority studies, what you want to see is that it's non-inferior both in the intention to treat population and in the per protocol population to know it's not just poor adherence in the uh, control arm or the the base arm in the non-inferiority study that's the reason why you're non-inferior. It's easy to be non-inferior to doing a shitty job. So you also want to confirm non-inferiority in the per protocol analysis. You got to think about that. That's a more technical point. But here, I expected to see a bigger benefit in the as-treated analysis than the intention to treat analysis. That was my expectation. I was surprised to find that the as-treated analysis is null. The confidence interval crosses one. It's a negative study by as-treated analysis. It's only positive in intention to treat. Now, that I wouldn't draw much from that point. From some many of these points, I wouldn't draw a firm conclusion from any of them in isolation. But let's put it all together. Ten years of accrual. You've excluded most of the people. You've excluded the people in whom this pump is being placed routinely in the hospital. You have a negative as treated analysis. You have a positive primary analysis, but just oh so barely, so, so barely. And you've barely barely lost any alpha for your interim analysis, which you're not telling me all about, which is weird. Um, You have differences not just in what they got, the pump or no pump, they're getting more pressors, and there are differences in the rates of subsequent treatments that may even be counterproductive. The control arm is getting more ECMO, for instance. So what am I to, and, and the prior literature is just stone cold negative. They're all these negative studies, okay? So what am I to think? Am I to think that these investigators have lucked in to the one situation where this is a benefit? And it's also, if it were really a benefit, you'd see a much bigger difference between the curves and the p-value more significant. It's just a, you know, it's a, it's a benefit, but it's, 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 is this the one situation where there's a benefit or is this the one trial that is an outlier precisely because it's small, you know, it took a long time to accrue, um, it uh, has all these sort of other differences between the arms that might actually drive it. This is the perfect setting, the perfect setting for a confirmatory study. This is literally why people want confirmatory studies. We want to know, does the routine placement of this very expensive pump actually improve outcomes from people? Or did this study just happen to slip by that statistical significance threshold merely because of these idiosyncrasies? The fact there's a little more mechanical ventilation, a little more presser use up front. Is that the reason? And the fact that the as-treated signal is not, is not significant, but the per protocol, or sorry, the intention to treat is, but the per protocol isn't, might be a clue that there might be some imbalances even in the intention to treat population. Might be. So what do I think of this danger shock? I mean, 
to me, it is a bit embarrassing to see so many cardiologists pop the champagne when they have barely, barely got this across the finish line and they've been trying really hard. I would love to see more people say, this is a very provocative finding. It's something very interesting. Unfortunately, it doesn't apply to a lot of people. In fact, the majority of people in whom you might think about this therapy. But I would really love a confirmatory study. This needs a confirmatory study. Paradigm HF needed a confirmatory study. Vasepa needs a confirmatory study. Many of these studies are very, very odd. In the Vasepa control arm, you're getting a mineral oil enema from, no, you're not an enema, but you're getting a mineral oil laxative from taking all those placebos. We need confirmatory studies when there are vagaries and idiosyncrasies in control arms that might drive the outcome. And again, it's just barely past the significance thresholds. If you're a Bayesian and you look at all the totality of improving cardiac output and cardiogenic shock after MI, wouldn't you conclude that it doesn't work? If you were a Bayesian, if you were a meta-analyst and you looked at all the modalities, wouldn't you conclude it doesn't work? Isn't it weird that in medicine we run 20 trials and then we celebrate when one p-value is below 0.05, or in this case 0.048? Isn't that interesting? Because if you run 20 trials under the null assumption that you're sampling from the same distribution, how many p-values are going to be significant? Think about it, okay, right? It's a distribution, and of course, in five is not is perhaps even the modal uh, frequency of the distribution. So if you're on 100 studies, and if you're on 21, would be the modal distribution. Okay, what's my point here? My point here is that danger shock is interesting. It's not a slam dunk. It's got these open holes in it. And I didn't hear anyone talk about that. So that's why I'm making this video. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and, uh, and, uh, and sign up for notifications on this channel. Um, check out Plenary Session. Plenary Session Podcast is where I do critical appraisal of articles. I think this is the, the single thing that we teach that we ought to teach medical trainees and the single thing we do the worst job at. We keep adding all this nonsense to the medical curriculum, including I see in UCLA, they're teaching students that being fat has, uh, is, is merely a stigma and has no health consequences, so it's okay to be fat. They're teaching them that. That's actually covered this week. Instead of teaching nonsense, why don't we teach how to read some articles? That's what I think. So you're not going to get it in the medical school. Unfortunately, they don't want to build it in the curriculum. You're going to get it on sensible medicine, you're gonna get my Benai Prasad's observations and thoughts, and you're gonna get it on plenary session and, and this video. So those are my thoughts, danger shock. Until next time.